It's Talking Head Week apparently here at JSU Sense, and that's what we do when uh, I have topics I want to talk about. So feel free to minimize this video, put on uh, I don't know, some tunes or something that you like. And today I'm going to talk to you about my, it's been over 30 days now technically, since I switched to 12th gen here with my system at work. I know it's a little bit late from the uh, launch of 12th gen, but I want to give you a little bit of a medium length user report here so I can tell you about some of the struggles and issues I've had with it. Uh, that way you can make an informed decision about whether or not it's for you and I can decide whether or not I still want to use it in my own personal rig. We interrupt this video to bring you a special message from iFixit. No, we interrupt this interruption with this interruption about new stuff from iFixit. We should even grab this card, but inventory sucks. Fix the inventory problems with iFixit. Whoa, don't drop it. Can't fix that with iFixit. Just kidding, yes you can. Wish you could take iFixit with you anywhere but your pockets aren't big enough. Introducing the new Moray. And the new Mino. Take them with you anywhere. So get iFixit for your loved ones or just get them for yourself. So one of the reasons why I waited to even move to 12th gen uh, to use it even in an everyday scenario here like at the office is because I had to wait for some BIOS progression and maturity when it comes to the motherboards. Now to preface this, I've only done this with one system so far with one man motherboard, one manufacturer, et cetera, et cetera. So that being the ITX build that you guys saw me build uh, in the Fantex case. So that is clearly using an ITX motherboard. It's an ASUS board, it's a Z690, and it's a pretty solid board. Um, I, I haven't noticed over the last couple generations where you're truly giving up anything going from an ATX board to an ITX board. ASUS has done a very good job at basically keeping it from being stripped of any sort of feature sets, reliability, cooling ability, VRMs, or any of that stuff. So I don't feel like my situation here would be exclusive to ITX. I think it would be basically, you know, cross compatible with all of the, the ASUS motherboards out there. Now your results may obviously vary if you're using a Gigabyte board, MSI board, ASRock board, whatever other boards are out there. Um, so mine is obviously gonna be specific to ASUS. Now with that said, the problems that we've experienced in the past with systems, especially with day one adoption, or even I would just, we didn't adopt day one, it was quite a few months in, but I feel like ASUS has been struggling with just some of the weird nuances in their BIOS now for a while. And my previous video, I talked about the corners that manufacturers have had to cut to keep, keep up with demand. I'm not sure how many of these problems are also specific to potentially that versus it just being new generation because all the Ryzen stuff that we have here in this studio is also on ASUS motherboards and they haven't been experiencing any of the weirdness. Well, Phil's system lately, the Threadripper system's been acting out kind of weird, but that's GPU related and it seems like the 6900X minus, XT might have started suddenly being all weird, but uh, that's neither here nor there. We're talking about 12th gen. My system is also running DDR5. We're running two sticks for 64 gigs. And let me just start by saying that with updated BIOS, which obviously updates the microcode for the CPU as well, improves the memory compatibility as much as possible. And I will put the full specs of my system down below because again, my experience is gonna be specific to these parts that I'm using. It's not like I had five systems going with different parts which would then allow us to collect you know, a bunch of data. I'm just telling you what my experience was with this system. But even though we've had updated BIOS and stuff, one of the major issues I experienced right away with 12th gen was if I unplugged my system and moved it out here into the studio and plugged it back in, it would work. And then I would move it back into our editing den and then suddenly get a no post situation. Clearing CMOS, nothing. Um, taking out a stick of RAM, just doing BIOS flashback even, nothing. Just push the power button and it would fire up, but no post, no video, no, it wouldn't progress. The, Q, the ITX boards don't give you an LCD layout or a readout, so it's kind of harder to see what's happening there. You just have LEDs and not even like a QR number sequence, but just LEDs that light up red, green, or white. Just nothing, nothing at all. So I would move it back out here into the, into the studio and I would go back into the office maybe an hour later and then Phil would be like, what'd you do to fix it? I'd be like, nothing, literally nothing. I just sat out here clearing CMOS 15 times, powering it on, nope, nothing, flip the power switch, clear CMOS, and after like maybe 10 times and letting it sit for a little while, then it would decide it wants to work. So the interesting thing about that is I don't know if that's DDR5, I don't know if that's the CPU itself, 
I don't know if it's some quirk with the motherboard. I don't know if it had something to do with the GPU. Now, when I mentioned the GPU, one of the changes that I made moving to this 12th gen system was also switching from a water-cooled RTX 3090 to a Founders Edition 3080 Ti. But one thing we do know is that NVIDIA did have an updated vBIOS for the uh, display UEFI, which was uh, just to give it compatibility with all the different monitors and stuff that are out there. It was specific to 3080 Ti. I had loaded that up on there, um, and the problem seems to be less. However, I thought about bringing my system out here today just to have it on the table so you guys could see it, but I was so afraid of it doing the issue I just mentioned again that I was unwilling to unplug it and move it out here. The other thing too is something that I had not experienced in quite a while actually um, is random lockups and blue screens. So even, even just yesterday, uh, we were playing some Rocket League around here and or maybe it was the day before, whatever. I was in the middle of a ranked match and then 30 seconds into playing, my system just completely locked up. And, and not typical lockups on modern hardware has been recoverable where it would go to a black screen and then maybe re re reboot. This was just the actual frozen image on the screen. Everything's completely dead, like a hard lock. Had to cycle the system, start it up, and then everything seemed to work fine. But when I first built this system, we were seeing a lot of blue screens as well. And Phil would giggle and laugh about it because it's like, dude, it's the irony is that the only computer around here that's been giving us any sort of issues whatsoever is the 12th gen system. Now it's important to note, there was no overclocking applied on this system. Because of the, um, the limiting cooling that I have in the small case, I haven't turned on any of the uh, ASUS enhancements and stuff. So with the ASUS motherboards, you have the multi-core enhancement and all that, and with the P-core, E-core, um, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to experience any of the voltage increases that you're gonna see to get the CPU to go any farther. I mean, it already was going to 5.3 gigahertz all core, uh, 3.8 gigahertz uh, all core on the E cores, and then you know P core, like I said, was 5.3 single core. I said all core, and it was going 4.9 to 5.0 all core. Perfectly fine. The IPC improvement in 12th gen is so good that it was no reason whatsoever to overclock it. So it's one of those things where I, I couldn't even figure out like what was causing these blue screens. The 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 code that would show every time was something different. And it's indicative of like a bad overclock, the type of problems that we were having. But I'm starting to think it might have had something more to do with memory. So I even stopped running XMP profile on my memory altogether. I'm only running at 4,000 megahertz, even though they're 5,200 or 5,600 megahertz dims because of the fact that I can't even trust that the DDR5 and the 12th gen are gonna play nicely in this particular system. This system goes against so many like fibers of mine, which is I overclock everything, I XMP profile everything, and I didn't do any of that because I was trying to keep the stability as high as possible. Now I'm finally at a point where I feel like things are fairly solid with the system, but not solid enough for me to feel confident to unplug it and bring it out here, as I already mentioned. But it's not all bad. 12th gen for games, even though I stepped down from a 3090 water-cooled, which will maintain its max boost clocks for a lot longer than anything air-cooled, uh, down to a 3080 Ti, there are only a few percentage points difference in terms of air-cooled to air-cooled. Um, there would be a wider gap between an, water-cooled 3090 and air-cooled 3080 Ti. Uh, the, it was obvious 11th gen, 10th gen, and even AMD are bottlenecking the 3080 Ti and the 3090. And by bottlenecking, I mean, if we put in a faster CPU and we see more FPS, clearly the GPU is being held back by the CPU because the CPU is the factor that changed. It has been an absolute beast to game on. Load times are clearly fast. Operating around and, and clicking around in Windows 11, which by the way, might be a turnoff for many people. Although I don't have any problems with Windows 11, it's been solid. I haven't had any compatibility issues. Um, I think in general, the PC crowd is just super resistant to any new OS, which uh, isn't surprising. But if you wanna take advantage of the scheduler and the E core and P core, you need Windows 11 anyway. It's fast. Clicking around, things are instantaneously popping up. Remember, it is PCIe Gen 4, so having a PCIe Gen 4 SSD in there versus my 10th gen, I can notice a, a, a quicker response to clicking something, having it open, open anything in Adobe Suite, and the speed at which is op it opens is pretty obvious that both I.O. on the drive and the CPU's speed and responsiveness is just a game changer. I, you don't really realize how, I'm not gonna say slow, because there's nothing slow about AMD and there's nothing slow about 10th or 11th gen Intel, but when you can feel the responsiveness difference between 12th gen, that tells you just how fast it is. 
because something that felt fast already feels faster. It, it's kind of eye-opening on how kind of amazing technology is today when it comes to CPUs. If you're waiting for AM5 from AMD, you're probably gonna need Windows 11 also anyway. I bet you a hundred bucks, uh, more than that even, that it's gonna be required. But it's actually not been bad when it comes to the system actually working. Um, it's just, it's that, it's that bleeding edge tech that I've talked about in a ton of my videos. And now this might seem like, well, this is just a phone home video, Jay, why are you talking about this? One, I've done this for every new platform I've ever built a system for. I did it when I moved from a uh, bulldozer slash pile driver to a 3770K with Intel. That was my first Intel rig since Pentium. Uh, I did it when I moved from the 3770 to the 4790K. I did it when I moved from there to the X platform, X99. And then I did it again when I moved to X299. And then I did this again when I moved to Ryzen where I built the system and used it. Cause that's the only way you can get a true grasp of what the system is like. Cause you have to use it every day in all of your use case work scenarios where you can start to figure out the nuances of a new system. And you can bet your ass we're gonna do it when AM5 comes out. And we're gonna do it when the new Intel CPU comes out, which I keep hoping for an extreme platform. I miss kind of being on extreme platform from Intel because it was ridiculous, but I think AMD's changed things. With the core counts getting so high on mainstream, I feel like extreme platform is something that Intel is probably really not considering to be too important. And if they can't keep the heat under control right now with, uh, you know, eight, uh, not 18 cores, but whatever the total core count is, I forget, on, on 12th gen, they sure as hell can't cram more, right, in there. So anyway, it's not all bad though. It's, it's not, it comes at a premium. It's hot. You need a heck of a, a cooler to keep it cool. Um, the 5900X that we did our testing with the other day with the little printed fan shroud thing that we did. Remember that was hitting 140 watts at the start of the test with 24 cores. And then would drop down to about 120 watts after it starts to drop its boost or its turbo clocks after the cooler got too hot. The 12th gen is hitting 250 watts and up to 280 watts if you're overclocking at all. And even beyond that, if you use a water cooler and overclock it even farther, that's a lot of heat and a lot of power draw to consider if you're doing a lot of heavy work, computational workloads, which is keeping the CPU at a, uh, you know, a high clock speed, which is gonna keep the voltage up and the wattage up, which could also keep your power build up. I did a whole video about how much your bill would actually be affected by CPUs. Maybe I should do it again. It's not as much as you might think, but anyway, I digress. I feel like we've moved on far enough with the maturity of BIOS that it's less of an issue from day one, but I can tell you the day we built the system when it first came in here and then we needed to review it, it took a minute to get it up and running. It was kind of interesting. Like, I think it's just because you got new, new platform, right? New chipset, new socket, new CPU, new RAM. And all of that needs to be taken into account if you're gonna consider using the system. So at the end of the day, if you're looking for, quite honestly, like the best gaming system that you can buy if money is not too much of a concern because the CPU does cost more than the 5800X 3D, which AMD came out with, which is specifically designed for gaming and such. Um, the snappiness of it, the IPC, the high frame rates with a high-end GPU, you really can't go wrong. What I need to do is build a 12th gen on DDR4 platform and see if those problems of experiencing go away, then we'll know it's actually the RAM that's the issue. But anyway, if any of you out there have adopted 12th gen Intel, can you please comment down below what your use has been like, what, what your experience has been? Has it been great? Do you regret it? Do you feel like you're bleeding with that bleeding edge technology where you're kind of like, man, the issues I'm experiencing are just like nonstop. That's how I felt for a while, but the system's actually doing pretty good right now. And my personal rig, the only thing that makes me kind of reluctant to go forward with 12th gen and not maybe even just pivot to something else in the middle of this build is because of my live streams that I do from home. I cannot have system stability problems on a live streaming computer. That's just not, that's obviously not gonna work. I'm a little nervous about that one. We'll just have to see. Um, I might go forward with it, but it really depends on how soon AM5 is gonna be and how far away Intel's latest stuff is and 12th gen might be one worth skipping altogether. So anyway, comment down below your opinions on that. Thanks for listening to today's video. And uh, if you've got a video idea for us that you think that we should do, you can uh, send us your ideas over at JCSense at Twitter and uh, we'll do the best we can to incorporate it. Thanks for watching guys and we'll see you in the next one.